How's it going everyone? Ben here and today we are going to be talking about awkward experiences with our medical providers, whether it's transphobic, ableist, or just Racist. outright. Yeah, that too. And with this discussion today, we're also going to be including my wonderful partner, Dandelion. Hello. Because they too have experienced really awkward situations with their medical provider. Okay, so the way this is going to work is this. we're just going to bounce off little happenings that happened to us while we were at our clinic visits. So why don't you go first? You tell me a situation. Okay, this one time I went to get a pap smear and um, I already knew I was going to the wrong place because it was uh, a women's clinic, like the, the name in the title was a women's clinic so i wasn't necessarily expecting them to be very trans inclusive um but you know they were within my network so i went and um while i was just getting this routine yearly pap smear the um obstetrician that was working on me or no the gynecologist both both okay the gynecologist that was working on me was like um yeah, you have less than three inches between the bottom rib and the top of your hip. It's going to be really difficult for you to carry children. And I was just like, I'm sorry, what? I, I didn't hear what she said at first because it didn't make any fucking sense because I don't, <laughs> I didn't go there for that <laughs> at all. Um, and I, I was confused. I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, uh, you don't have enough space to carry children. Um, so you might want to be careful when you start having children and I was like I don't want children and she said oh <laughs> while she was inside of my vagina <laughs> I'm laughing because of how weird that situation was like she made so many assumptions about you about my body about my lifestyle um it was just very a very uncomfortable how old were you I was this is maybe like three or four years ago so I was in my early 20s not a lot of people even want, like, if, even, like, cis people want children that young. No, the world's burning. That's <laughs> stupid. Yeah, so, like, for her to assume that, one, you are not trans is kind of alarming because lots of trans people need to go to the OBGYN. I mean, I even wrote a full-on paper about mm -hmm. this. But also the fact that I do think the term women's health clinic was kind of started making like assumptions assumptions about who is going to OBGYN clinics but originally it was made to empower cis women to go get their medical needs met but what about me what yeah. about my trans ass what about even even someone like me I need to get pap smears done too so um, over time it became incredibly exclusionary and unfortunately a lot of medicine hasn't made moves to change the terminologies associated with going to the OBGYN. Mm -hmm. But honestly, that was that was really messed up. While you're up in my coochie? <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> also, I, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there is also kind of like that uh, a barrier of language for trans men or like trans mask people or, you know, even non-binary people who do want to have children just to have like women's space mm -hmm. labeled across like this area that should just be for reproductive justice like women's spaces can exist within reproductive justice spaces that's what those spaces are for um so i don't know whatever and you know i've even talked to trans women and they found the term women's clinic to be very like gender euphoric but at the same time it is very very exclusionary and i think instead of like establishing these institutions as exclusionary what we should do is make it inclusionary. So if a trans woman were to come to an OBGYN clinic, the OBGYN clinic refers to her with her pronouns, reaffirms her gender identity, and like it should be on an individual basis. And I think that's where it should go. You mean inclusive? Yeah. I love your English. My English is okay, I guess. <laughs> okay, so now it's my turn to detail my account. All right, so this, this visit was with a optometrist so it wasn't it wasn't for like a primary care it was actually for me to go, go get my annual eye exam and at this point when I went to this optometrist I was maybe like six months on testosterone and I remember 
sitting there and my optometrist comes in, first of all, the receptionist and everyone is gendering me incorrectly the entire time. And they didn't even ask my pronouns. But I'm like, at this point, like I, I was very gender, like you couldn't really tell whether or not. Ambiguous. Yeah, I was gender ambiguous. I was very gender fluid at the time when I went. And this optometrist asked me what my drug list was. At, at first it was very conversational. She was having a full on conversation with me. It was friendly. Then she asked me about my medications that I'm currently taking because whatever medications you take can affect the health of your eyes. So I was listing them off and she was smiling, right? And as soon as I said testosterone, the smile immediately turned into a grimace. And she didn't even acknowledge it. Like she completely ignored that. Like she didn't even, she didn't even say, yeah, yeah, I got that. Like she completely stopped what she was doing and went, went towards the eye exam and like stopped making conversation with me. Like it was just like, matter of fact let's get it done and let's get you out of the door after that we can tell when <laughs> the energy changes and like she knew i was a medical student she knew that i was at least somewhat in the activism field because i told her like what i liked doing and she just didn't want to acknowledge that i was trans so this one is specifically about a family member um and like basically detailing like uh, medical racism that occurred. So um, this family member got um, one of those mesh implant IUD thingies mm -hmm. um, for like you know birth control um, and just reproductive health, and it ruptured and started causing a lot of pain, and eventually became a, like a, the the scarring that it caused became um, like tumorous, mm -hmm. and um, she was complaining about the pain for months almost. Um, and it wasn't until she came in and said, if you don't document why you're not like doing anything about this, I'm going to ask for like a second opinion and like report you to whatever medical board thing doctors get reported to. And finally they did some testing and they found out that she had the tumor the size of a, a grapefruit, um, like in her uterus. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was... It was not benign. <laughs> so this, this family member had cancer. And um, they were able to get rid of it with just radiation. She didn't have to go into chemo, thankfully, but they were able to get rid of it with just radiation. Um, but even then, like, I don't know, like, what is the, what is the decision making behind that? Like, why not chemo? Is it because it's um, less aggressive? A lot of things actually respond better to radiation than chemo. Okay, you can edit that Yeah. Part. No, but it's okay. Like, I think people need to know that, like, sometimes not all all cancers we use chemo to help treat. A lot of it's just radiation based because it's so responsive to radiation. Okay, yay. Um, later on, she also ex started experiencing a lot of pain unrelated to the cancer that they found, but just like intense pain throughout her lower body. And still, like, no one's done anything about it. This was like maybe almost six years ago when the pain started. And she's been to three or four different physicians and everyone's like, well, we can't give you any pain medication because X, Y, Z. We don't want to do any um, CAT, CAT scans because X, Y, Z. We don't want to do any of this, any of that. It's too expensive. It's invasive. It's this, it's that. And so like, it, she's just expected to live in pain. Yeah, this is like the big problem we have with medicine is that some physicians see medical care as gatekeeping like they want to gatekeep patients from having access to a lot of medical treatment that they should get done and while other physicians which i think are better physicians are door openers they open doors for patients you don't ever want to go to a gatekeeping physician but unfortunately the large majority of physicians in america are gatekeeping physicians and yeah i don't think this is intentional but, yeah. yeah i i just think there's not a lot of training in you know, humanism, that's not accentuated in medical education. We're taught how to diagnose, how to treat, but we're never taught how to treat a patient with dignity. And I've had this problem many times, even advocating for other patients. And I do like what your family did a lot because they made the doctor document the fact that they weren't giving them 
pain medication and they weren't doing certain things because I think that's how you can advocate for yourself as a patient. Yeah. Ask your physician to document everything that they're denying you because then the doctor is more inclined to actually give you something if they have to document that they couldn't provide you something. Yeah. You know what's best for your body. Yeah. And you know, you yourself have got, gotten through a similar thing where doctors just wouldn't give you a straight up answer mm -hmm. about a diagnosis. Yeah, um, so I had um, a tumor in my breast um, that was eventually removed, but the keyword there is eventually. Um, and I had to get rid of my nipple piercing. That pissed me, that's what pissed me off the most. How dare you, <laughs> medical system. <laughs> Medical industrial complex. <laughs> I think that was just the limitation of the device that was used. Probably. <laughs> Ooh, another really like big incident that I personally had when it comes to basically medical ableism, but also like denying people with invisible illnesses. One time when I was maybe 20, 21 years old, I was just applying to medical school, but I was also considering going to osteopathic medical schools and one of the requirements to apply to osteopathic schools is I had to shadow an osteopathic physician and there's not a lot out there in specifically our state so I emailed the board in my state and they hooked me up with a physician to shadow and I didn't know this man at all but I was really excited to go and shadow him when I arrived um, he was like you know mid mid 40s white man who was a physician and he was showing me around Sorry. and then why are you laughing <laughs> i'm just imagining <laughs> those guess who games <laughs> where you flip the face down yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, white man mid 40s the doctor <laughs> Damn it. but yeah so um we were we were shadowing it was a great experience then he took me to like you know the room where he discusses patients and things like that and one of his patients were, was on warfarin. And warfarin, if you don't know, is a blood thinner, but originally it was a, uh, it was a chemical that was used for rat poison, but then they re-implemented it mm -hmm. as a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. But like, it's much less concentrated. Okay. Um, but you don't want to be insensitive about its history because a lot of patients take warfarin for blood disorders. So he was like, laughing about warfarin in front of me and saying oh did you know it was used for rat poison and then i was like my reaction <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> and like i would understand if he's just trying to teach me a fact but the fact that he was laughing and like it was his patient that was taking warfarin that really didn't sit right with me but also my sister was taking warfarin at the time and he didn't know that and then i kind of i kind of just like i didn't want to play along with him i really wanted to hold him accountable so what i did was like oh you know my my sister actually takes warfarin and his laughing stopped <laughs> like he immediately stopped laughing and he he realized that what he said was really in front of the gosh darn patient <laughs> <laughs> what he said was really insensitive because you don't know someone's history you don't know someone's family who might be taking this drug that you're laughing about so he immediately he saved himself he made he took some form of accountability and was like uh you know it's it's just interesting to me that it was this thing and it turned that's not accountability something. that's doubling down honestly that's yeah. what we call he doubling made an down. excuse <laughs> he did make an excuse i'm sorry i'm giving this person too much credit he made an excuse and like kind of the conversation ended right there but I also thought it was very insensitive. Yeah. Because um, this was in front of the patient. No, it wasn't in front of the patient. It was in the back room. Uh -huh. But still, I think it was insensitive that he was talking about this drug that he's prescribing his patient. Ooh, but this doctor had, like, there's more stuff that I have to say about this doctor. So this doctor also had another patient who was this, like, little old white lady. And she was very much Republican. And even though her ideology might not align with mine this doctor was yelling at this patient for being a republican like he was mad that she was gonna vote for trump which i don't agree with at all like if i were to disagree with my patient and i wanted to tell them i would say it respectfully but he was yelling at this like 80 something year old lady 
about why she's voting for Trump. Was he yelling at her because of like Medicare? Medicaid, whichever one it is. I don't remember necessarily, but I just remember this patient getting super sad. But yeah, I just thought it was super insensitive. There's different ways to disagree with someone. And like this person is obviously in a lower position of power in this clinic setting than you, and you're yelling at this person. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I, I know, it, it's really messed up. Like, I just couldn't. In front of you. In front of me, a complete stranger. So he was further embarrassing this patient with a medical student in the room. I wasn't a medical student. I was just an undergrad student at the time. Mm. Yeah, so he was a character. Also, super big disclaimer that I want to put out there is this doctor's really bad behavior. It does not equate to the fact that he's an osteopathic physician. There are numerous very good, very affirmative osteopathic physicians out there. I know there's a bunch of stigma against osteopathic physicians for some reason, even though they get the same amount of training. And that's why I even considered it as something I wanted to do with my life. But I ended up going into MD school, but just putting that out there. Okay, that's it for this video. We have basically said as much as we want to about our experiences with medical providers discriminating against us. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that you enjoyed my fiance visiting for this video. And I hope you will share it with someone who may benefit from this information. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Do not follow my partner. Leave me alone. Because I'm the influencer. They want a private life. And I'll see you all in the next video. This has been.